All right, well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Mission Navy Yard. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, tonight's forum is Who's Right? Millennials, Gen Z, and the Future of American Conservatism. My name is Jesse Arm, and I'm the Director of External Affairs at the organization that is hosting us all for tonight's program, the Manhattan Institute. The Manhattan Institute is a public policy think tank, and in Washington, D.C., where most of you all live, you know, you could probably get away with telling people you work at a think tank and people nod with understanding. In New York, where I live and where our organization is based, uh, I tell people I work at a think tank and they kind of give me blank stares. So sometimes I'm a little bit more specific and I say, the Manhattan Institute is a community of scholars, journalists, and activists who are unified and united by a shared commitment to advancing economic prosperity, promoting educational pluralism, defending colorblindness, and preserving law and order in America and its great cities. But that is kind of a mouthful, and especially when you're at a bar, so for tonight's purposes, we're just gonna go with think tank. In my role at MI, I am responsible for promoting the specific, actionable policy solutions that are generated by our deep bench of scholars, including experts on economic growth, education, energy and the environment, healthcare, legal reform, race and urban policy. I connect the work of our fellows with lawmakers, candidates and interest groups. In fact, that's how I know most of you here tonight and why I'll be pestering the rest of you with some policy brief or email to get coffee in the very near future. So what is it that makes the Manhattan Institute unique? Well, Midtown Manhattan is not exactly the most hospitable environment for a conservative think tank. But in a time of urban-rural polarization, there is a need for organizations that speak to the pragmatic majority in our cities and suburbs. Through extensive polling, we've identified a group that we call the Metropolitan Majority, a multi-ethnic block of voters in and around America's cities who care about crime, the cost of living, and the quality of public education. They embrace proactive policing, school choice, and economic freedom. To appeal to these Americans, we offer policy ideas that foster economic dynamism and growth for businesses and families. And we push back against proposals that do the opposite. For example, the destructive Green New Deal. We've focused on cr improving crime control, countering false narratives about policing and the criminal justice system, and introducing evidence-based, tough love solutions to issues like homelessness, serious mental illness, and public disorder. Among our highest priorities is pushing back against racial essentialism. By building a broad-based coalition that values Americans, America's diversity, but recognizes that it is wrong to define someone's character, trustworthiness, or culture based on the color of their skin, we fight divisive identity politics, reject the principle that white supremacy is the defining fact of American life, and argue that children, some as young as grade school, ought not to be divided into groups of oppressors and oppressed based on pigmentation or complexion. Leading influencers within our organization like Christopher Rufo, Heather McDonald, Glenn Lowry, and Jason Riley are promoting an agenda that can help all Americans, regardless of race, color, or creed, build proud and self-determined lives. And the evidence of urbanites and suburbanites rejecting progressive overreach is not just seen in our opinion polling. We've seen extensive proof of this shift in political contests that took place in 2021. In Minneapolis, a ballot measure to defund the police was soundly defeated. In Austin, voters chose not to bring back a ban on homeless encampments. In Buffalo, a socialist on the ballot for mayor was defeated by a candidate running a write-in campaign. Seattle elected a law and order Republican as their city attorney, Seattle. And in deep blue New Jersey, which no one thought could be competitive territory for the GOP, the Republican gubernatorial candidate, virtually unknown at the time, running on an agenda that rejected punitive taxation and endless COVID restrictionism, only narrowly lost to the Democratic incumbent. In Virginia, Glenn Youngkin turned a blue state red by mobilizing parents behind an agenda that embraced choice and reject race-obsessed indoctrination in schools. And even in my home of New York City, we elected a Democratic mayor who bucked his National Party's talking points on crime and derided wokeness throughout his campaign. I'll venture to guess that most of you in this room tend to agree with the statements I've laid out tonight. 
and are excited about the way the political winds are blowing in this country ahead of the 2022 midterm elections. I would also assume that most of you in some way, shape, or form are identified with the American political right. And if you'll allow me one more sneaking suspicion about this audience here tonight, given that we are at Mission Navy Yard, I will assume that there are not too many boomers in the room here tonight. <laughs> with that in mind, this evening's discussion is meant to explore what unites conserv is not is meant to explore not only what unites conservatives, but to delve into probing to questions where our answers may be different. When American political movements fall out of power, it is customary that they go back to the drawing board. They determine where to double down, where to change course, and how they should govern when they get the next opportunity to do so. Now is the time for the populists, the libertarians, the nationalists, and the classical liberals, all who all count themselves as part of the American right to healthily debate policies, foreign and domestic, social and economic. Tonight's panelists and speakers are an impressive group of conservative journalists and organizers. They are all late millennials or members of Generation Z. So fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your feelings about Ronald Reagan or the dead consensus or Hungary, you'll be hearing from them for a while. Alexandra DeSantis is a staff writer for National Review and a visiting fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. She was previously a William F. Buckley Fellow in political journalism with the National Review Institute and graduated from the University of Notre Dame. Elliot Kaufman is the letters editor at the Wall Street Journal. He writes opinion articles and for three years he edited them for the journal. Raised in Toronto, he lives in New York and is a graduate of Stanford University. Saurabh Sharma is the president of American Moment and co-host of the Moment of Truth podcast. Born in Bangalore, India, he is a proud naturalized citizen of the United States and has lived across the country, from Lexington to Seattle, Austin to Washington, D.C., where he now lives. He is a graduate of the University of Texas at Austin. Is that right? That's how we do it? Oh, no, I got it wrong, like that, yeah. Moderating the panel will be my colleague, Teddy Kupfer, an associate editor at City Journal, a magazine published by the Manhattan Institute that provides unsparing coverage of the public policy issues that I've already discussed. Teddy previously worked at National Review where he overlapped with Alexandra. He grew up in central Pennsylvania, graduated from Johns Hopkins University, and now lives in Queens. And with that, I'll hand things over to Teddy. Well, thanks, Jesse, and thank you uh, to our panelists for agreeing to participate in a discussion that I'm sure will be both spirited and civil. Uh, I want to start off by thinking a bit about the title of this event, which is Who's Right? Uh, the question is an allusion to the tendencies that occupy the right side of the political spectrum. As Jesse suggests, social conservatives, libertarians, neoconservatives and populists, rhinos and reactionaries. But more controversially, the question could be construed to imply that some of these tendencies may be more authentically conservative than others, or that certain views should take priority in a conservative coalition. These divisions certainly exist, and I am sure that we will discuss them as the panel proceeds, but I wonder uh, if they might conceal an underlying unity here. Take the issues Jesse mentioned, rising crime, deteriorating public order, public health overreach, and the long march of progressivism through the institutions. <laughs> I think it's reasonable to assume, uh, no matter what you three believe, you all are concerned by these trends. So I suppose my first question to the panel, and I'll ask Alexandra first, um, do you think that these areas of agreement can form the basis for conservative politics in the year 2022, uh, or not? Yeah, I think that they can. Um, I, I tend to think that the areas where conservatives agree are a lot more important than where we disagree when it comes to who we elect, at least. I guess once, what they do once they're in office is not necessarily um, as simple. But I would point to, I guess, the, the campaign of Glenn Youngkin um, in particular as evidence that the things we agree on are more important because what the left is doing right now, I think, troubles conservatives a lot more than uh, what we ought to do in response, right? I think we all know that we're at a moment where um, the left is going particularly crazy. They're pushing for things that are deeply unpopular, as Youngkin showed, and the success, success of his campaign showed. Um, and I think even though conservatives might disagree a bit about what we should do in response if we're elected or if we're um, in charge, uh, we know that unseating Democrats is more important or, or pushing back against the left is more important than quibbling over where we might disagree. And I suppose the problems we've had with Trump um, <laughs> might, uh, yeah, 
dispute that a little bit, but um, for the most part, I think that responding to the left is the most important thing, and even if we disagree, um, yeah, we can do that without fighting over the things where we, where we disagree, I suppose. Sarah, what do you think? I think that if you take the question that you posed very narrowly, in 2022, what should the right be running on? Ending the disorder in our cities, the racialization of public education, and in general, the overreach of the left is perfectly fine. Um, I think that in any other time horizon, medium, long term, uh, it is wholly insufficient. Uh, if all the right can muster in the United States is the idea that after the left wins, decades and decades and decades of victories will marshal the tiniest response to slow them down a little bit, that's not a governing agenda. And eventually, permanent political victories or something that look close to permanent political victories are very possible on the left of center. Um, I look for more than just a reactive agenda um, that can be held by the right, but an actual positive one that has something to offer more than the American, uh, something to offer to the American people more than we're not just those crazy people over there. We have, there's a reason to vote for us that isn't just, um, you don't want to be ruled by these demented people anymore. Elliot, your reaction? Well, I think there's no reason why there couldn't be unity Especially now, as Saurabh mentions, conservatives are not in power. Opposition usually has a kind of unifying effect in that, uh, in that way. And we can agree on what we're against, and on what we're for, we can agree up to a point. So it seems like now, uh, on a variety of issues, unity could be possible. But I think, in many ways, it's a choice. I mean, if there are micro-movements on the right that would like to spend all their time bashing other people on the right, well then there's probably not going to be unity, right? And I think in, in many ways it's that simple. I mean, if we're going to have an environment on the right where even when the right is in opposition, anyone who has a kind of uh, traditional, you know, post-1945 foreign policy is going to be called a warmonger, or worse, a war criminal, if we're going to have a kind of right where anyone who thinks that, you know, uh, traditional small government conservatism doesn't care for the poor, there probably won't be unity on the right. I mean, that kind of rhetoric, that's, I mean, that's liberalism circa 2005. So, so, so if we're going to have 2005 liberalism on the right, even when we are in opposition, leading up to a winnable midterm election, no, I, I don't think unity is uh, in the cards, Teddy. So let's, let's ground uh, this discussion in some specific public policy demands. I hear a lot when conversations of this nature transpire that uh, social conservatism, social conservatives have been the junior partner in the conservative consensus. Uh, the foreign policy hawks got their muscular posture in Europe. Uh, the free marketeers got their tax reductions and privatization. And what do social conservatives get but a string of defeats? Uh, you know, Republicans almost stand idly by as abortion rights are entrenched in American life. Same-sex marriage is legalized. Raising a family on a single income becomes basically impossible, depending on where you live. Uh, Zan. Um, at the risk of making you go first again, I wonder to what extent you think this criticism is true, yeah. and if it is true, uh, to what extent we should jettison or at least be suspicious of the institutions that presided over this uh, junior partnership. Yeah, I think it's fair to call it a junior partnership, and I think I would start by just saying uh, on a big picture level, part of the problem uh, when it comes to conservatives and, and social policy, social issues, social policy, I think, is typically something um, it's like a word we use to discuss a cultural problem. And I think um, something that I like and admire and appreciate about the conservative perspective is that cultural problems are not first and foremost something that the government solves. Um, our cultural problems are something we solve on a cultural level. You know, it's families, individuals, communities, um, you know, civil society. Those are the, the first kind of bulwark against cultural problems. And so the federal government doesn't need to come in and solve every social issue that we might have. And that's why I would say, to the extent that what you just mentioned is true, there's a junior partnership, um, it exists at the federal level. And so, for example, 
Um, you know, a couple of years back, we had Republicans in control of the Senate, the House, and the presidency. They've been promising for something like 10 years to defund Planned Parenthood. Did they defund Planned Parenthood when they were in charge? No. They passed a tax cut, which is fine. I'm perfectly happy for them to do that. Uh, but they, uh, you know, Republicans tend to run at the national level on um, uh, defund Planned Parenthood or other kind of social conservative promises, and then they get in office and they kind of forget about it. Um, but I don't think that means that kind of on the whole, the conservative movement or the Republican Party as a whole doesn't care about social issues. I think it's just kind of at the national level that that's a problem. Um, and I think we've seen that, that change quite a bit lately. It's become a very salient issue, things like education. Uh, I think defund the police, that's a social issue, right? All these things that have been hot button issues, identity politics, um, obviously abortion has been a big issue. And I think the Republican Party is starting to notice, hey, wait a minute, as the other side goes crazy, kind of like I said before, we can push back against that in a way that resonates with the average American, even if they might not be as conservative as us. Um, so I, I kind of see that shifting quite a bit in a way where social conservatives actually have a, a kind of leadership role to take in the room. Gentlemen? I mean, one thing I think needs to be pointed out is that part of the reason that the position of social conservatism has deteriorated somewhat on the American right is that it has deteriorated somewhat in America. There are fewer social conservatives in America than there were a few years ago. And you could say that at almost any point in several uh, decades, uh, you know, more than that even. Um, so I think there just has to be some accounting for it. And when I see the renewed um, aggressiveness from social conservatism, it seems to me that it's not a sign of a new strength, but a reflection of a new weakness. Realizing that things aren't getting better and our position is getting worse, and therefore we have to be all the more aggressive in what we do, in what we say, or else what's gonna happen to us? And the problem with that strategy I think it helps push social conservatives even further into their corner. When they start talking about uh, not winning over Americans, but when they've kind of given up on that and say, we're gonna get power and then coerce Americans into doing what we couldn't win them over for anyway. I see that as a kind of trap for social conservatives whose causes I very much share. And the only other point I would make on that issue, just quickly, is that I think social conservatives sometimes underestimate how much they need other kinds of conservatives on these issues. When you think about an issue like religious liberty and who's actually doing that kind of work in the courts, when you think about an, an issue like school choice, for instance, which I think should be crucial for religious conservatives, traditional conservatives. Um, libertarians, economic conservatives, are um, actually doing a lot of the work in those areas. And I think without that alliance on those issues, uh, the position of social conservatives will get worse. So it's a, uh, it's a real problem, but I think a coercive strategy and a, and, a go it, and, and a go it alone strategy will only make it worse. So Rob, what do you think? Well, I actually think the last example that Elliot gave is a perfect uh, reason to uh, believe that social conservatives have been the junior partner in this coalition and that they should be the senior partner. Let's take the example of school choice, right? For the better part of three or four decades, the conservative movement has worn its yellow scarves one week every uh, year. It's gone and stood in front of state capitals and the national capital across the country, and it's proclaimed school choice week. And, and we all say that we're for school choice, but you look at most of the institutional forces that have been pushing school choice, the traditional arguments they made were these sort of um, uh, culturally secular arguments about efficiency, um, about um, you know, uh, ma making sure that, that people can go to better schools on, on the basis of grades or on the basis of the, the, uh, the conditions of the schools that they were in. And largely, that movement stagnated. 
why has education choice and really education policy in general experienced a shocking resurgence to prominence in American life today? Because the focus went from these secular arguments about efficiency to a purely culturally and socially conservative argument about what can be legitimately called anti-white racism in American schools. The institutionalization in public education of some of the most horrific racial essentialism that we've ever seen in American history. Um, that is an example of social conservatives having much more influence when they're in the driver's seat than uh, a more fiscally conservative, a more libertarian, a more culturally agnostic vision of conservatism would ever have. Um, as far as more broadly, um, why have social conservatives been relegated to the junior partner in the conservative movement? It doesn't really make any sense because at a constituent basis, social conservatives have much more representation vis-a-vis -vis the people actually in charge in Washington, or, or much less representation than do primarily fiscal libertarians or foreign policy hawks. It's not even close, and I think it's important to ask why that is and, and why we should continue to let it be the case when some of the most acute recent examples of conservative victories involve cultural issues that um, a, a GOP of yesteryear would not have touched with a 10-foot pole. Do you guys agree that it is, uh, you know, the, ener the recent energy in the school choice movement is uh, primarily a cultural phenomenon, a, a one of social conservatives? Or, you know, I hear lots of talk about parental rights, uh, you know, the notion that s local schools are under attack, democratic control of school boards, um, you know, is under attack by, by a sort of national agenda. Uh, I don't know what your, what your, I'm curious what both of your reaction to Star's remarks would be. Yeah, I, do you mind? Go first. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I think the argument of parental rights is, first of all, um, to my mind, the main argument that school choice proponents have been making all along. Uh, the idea has always been parents, you know, money should not stand in the way of where parents want to send their kids to school. And I think the reason it's become so salient now is precisely because of what the left is doing. And so while it's not a reactive policy to be pro-school choice now, conservatives are doing what they've always done. Uh, there's a very socially salient, as you say, reason for people to want school choice when suddenly there's something in public schools uh, that parents are really opposed to. I, I see parental rights and, and parents, uh, the, the, fam the primacy of the family, the primacy of the community being a very fundamentally socially conservative argument. Um, and I think it's become, yeah, it's become salient because of what the left is doing. Uh, uh, briefly, and then I'll move on to another question. Yeah, I just say, I don't see how you can talk about the resurgence of school choice without ever mentioning the pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, was this not a huge factor, what teacher unions did, or then parents actually hearing what their kids were being taught? I mean, so I think, uh, I think that was the sort of primary thing going. Uh, and to the point about critical race theory, um, all conservatives are opposed to critical race theory. Uh, it's not just a social conservative argument, it is a unifying argument. And so I'm very happy for that to, you know, continue to be a conservative message, along with what was dismissed as a concern about efficiency. That's a weird way of phrasing teaching your kids well. I don't think we talk about that in terms of efficiency. We talk about that as good education for children. So I don't see why we need to make that a weird libertarian argument. Surely all conservatives want that. So Elliot, I'll put you back on the spot um, as the Wall Street Journal representative on the panel. One thing, another thing I hear uh, when I have conversations like these, which is maybe more frequent than I'd like, is that uh, you know, the right-wing economic agenda is out of touch with the challenges the country faces today. We see China, as China rises, we hear about the need for maximal free trade and the problems with proposals to build industrial capacity. As drug overdoses skyrocket, labor part force participation remains anemic. We hear about the need for like occupational licensing reform. Uh, and as progressivism uses control of major institutions to stamp out dissident views, I hear a lot about you know, how the tech companies are very innovative and creating lots of value for their shareholders. Is there something to the critique that um, you know, what we need is more state action to both build up the country in the face of its external challenges and to repair its uh, sort of internal degeneration. Well, okay, those are a lot of issues. I mean, yeah, sorry, I'm I guess I together. Yeah, uh, I'd start with China 
on, uh, on that one. A new issue confronting us, let's say, although new, not so new, but um, China. Absolutely, the U.S. state needs to be there. It needs to be active. Uh, and when I hear about who actually thinks we shouldn't confront China and we should shrink from that, uh, it's often elements of these new micro-movements that want to use the state seemingly everywhere else. So that confuses me. Uh, where else do I see this kind of thing? Um, the Quincy Institute, let's say, this weird combination of like George Soros and Koch can come, to get, can come together to kind of agree that we should let China off the hook. Uh, so, I don't agree with that. Yeah, so sorry, um, I, I want to ask other you. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, go ahead if you, if you have more. Okay, no, well, I mean, you can stop there. But. Yeah, I, wa I would like to drill down on China a bit, and sure. I'll pose this question to you. Um, yes, so I recently heard a summary of the populist agenda uh, as encompassing hawkery on trade. So, you know, a kind of amp you move away from the free trade maximalism we used to have. Uh, hawker on immigration, you know, uh, border security. Hawkery on China, uh, because China is malign, but also restraint in foreign policy, which presents to me an obvious tension. I think Elliot sort of alludes to it. Uh, and yes, it's bubbled over in recent days. A, uh, three prominent, quote unquote, realignment figures called recently on the US to show China, quote, mutual respect for a civilizational equal and warned against descending into, quote, mindless hawkery. So I wonder how you think about this tension. I think there, it's fair to say there is a tendency toward foreign policy restraint on um, you know, some of the populist elements on the right, however we want to define that. I think it's also fair to say um, you know, China hawkery is an important. So, so how do we resolve this? Do we show them the respect that they're due? Do we try to check their economic advance only without sending to military tensions? How do you think about this? Sure. Uh, my primary concern about China is the systematic deindustrialization of the United States that has occurred over the last 30 to 40 years uh, that has largely accrued to their benefit. Um, the organization I run, American Moment, we have a list of 10 priorities, and the way we frame our priority about China goes as follows. China and the elites who enabled its rise are a generational threat to American prosperity. There's a couple elements of that that I, I want to draw attention to. One, the elites who enabled their rise. It was the choice of domestic policymakers in the United States to allow our industrial capacity to flow uh, to largely Southeast and Eastern Asia over the last 40 years. That was a choice that was made. It wasn't you know, the perfidious red dragon encircling the globe, choking off our trade lines. It was a decision that was made, and China, as a rational state actor, took advantage of that in order to create an industrial base in their country. So who should be held to blame? Um, I don't want to have some sort of national animosity towards China because they did what was rational on the globe, uh, global stage and saw a free lunch. I want to hold the policymakers in the United States that made those choices to account, and then I want to implement policy that would start to rebalance that trading alignment. The last part that I want to draw security to is American prosperity, um, maybe in contrast to American liberty. I am not worried about a million man swim across the Pacific Ocean by Chinese gunboats looking to invade Los Angeles. I don't think that's actually a problem. What I worry about is the fact that we have basically no native capacity for industrial production, for medicine production, for technology production, or anything else. And so in a world where political and economic and state capital is limited, and we have to focus on the most acute crises, I care a lot more about the fact that we can't make a silicon chip or a medicinal drug or steel in this country at the rate that we need in order to have some level of national autonomy, much more than I care about putting more aircraft carriers in the South China Sea. That's how I reconcile it. We need to dwindle uh, and draw down our foreign policy commitments across the globe so that Including we can divert. Including East Asia? Absolutely. So that we can uh, divert that attention and care and policymaking energy towards the acute domestic crises across every issue area, trade certainly being one of them um, that we face today. Sure. Your reactions? OK. Um, I mean, the first thing that I would want to take issue with is the idea that um, the decline in US manufacturing uh, was a choice. Um, I think the people who have looked at this have found 
that U.S. manufacturing jobs have declined at the same rate as most other Western nations, regardless of interventionist economic policies or not. Uh, there are secular issues at play. There are, for instance, labor advantages. Labor is much cheaper over there than here. The idea that the U.S. was going to keep the same amount of industrial jobs if policymakers just wanted it more or were just, you know, just cared more about certain people is, I think, um, you know, doesn't stand up to, to scrutiny there. Um, I'd also point out that U.S. manufacturing has not gone away. Um, it's, actually, um, it's actually increased. What's gone away are manufacturing jobs. Why? Because of, wage, um, because of wage advantages. So U.S. manufacturing has moved up on the value chain where capital plays more of a role and U.S. productivity can play more of a role. But on, on the foreign policy stuff, I think it's important to say that you know, uh, what people are talking about is not Chinese gunboats coming for us, but first for Taiwan. And if that happens, and if we don't try to stop this in any way, we, you know, we kind of draw down, give up on the Pacific, well then, our Pacific strategy is shot. And the rest of the countries in the region will have no choice but to rally to the Chinese side. And then, we're facing a real, um, a real juggernaut, including on economic terms, with the resources in the, in the uh, kind of economic block that China will be able to summon. So even if you are only worried about, you know, China as a, you know, uh, as a, you know, sort of, e sort of economic threat, rather than threat to American liberties, which, by the way, I think should be up there, I think we have strong reasons to think that, you know, U.S. military spending is at 3% of GDP now, down from Cold War peak of seven. It could be four, it could be five, and it would be worth it. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a ton to add to that. I think that's very well said. Is that something? It's just not, it's not clear to me that, um, that it's mutually exclusive to invest in U.S. manufacturing and try to build up our capacity to do some of the things that China does, does wow. for us. But um, I think there's something wrong with my mic. But, um, I, it's not mutually exclusive to focus on U.S. manufacturing to try to build it up and also to acknowledge that China is our number one enemy that wants to destroy us, right? They're, they didn't just happen to kind of step into this vacuum that policymakers uh, created. They intentionally exploited our weaknesses because they hate us, they want to destroy us, they're a human rights abuser. And so while we can focus on whatever problems we might have at home, I think it's important to keep that in mind as well. Those are not mutually exclusive. I mean, I, I just, the idea that we have this unlimited political uh, capital in order to pay equal and maximal attention to foreign policy commitments in East Asia and also the economic um, conflict that we're about to enter with China doesn't hold up because even in our own proximate sphere of influence, the Americas, we're incapable of uh, opposing China's rise there. Argentina just agreed to join the Belt and Road Initiative. The reason I'm not confident in our ability to maintain any sort of deterrent presence in Taiwan is because we're completely incapable of even doing a baseline diplomatic or economic um, uh, you know, sphere of, of control in our own hemisphere. Uh, the fact is, is that policymakers, the American government, um, they only have so much energy and time and it would be a serial misapplication of that resource to focus exclusively or, 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 or you know, maximally across the world when there are acute challenges that we can address with our economic relationship with China and trying to secure a, a, a sphere of influence in the Americas that is at the very least our own um, as opposed to this piecemeal approach across the globe. So we only have so much time, so let's focus on Argentina. Is that what I'm here? I mean, no, I, I, we, on, I, we only have so many resources. Argentina is governed by socialists. Of course it's doing this. Well, I mean, well, what does that prove? Well, because it seems to me that the territorial integrity and the economic sovereignty of the Americas is a much more acute priority for American policymakers, especially because 
um, the consequences of the policy failures in South America tend to redound to the United States' consequence, at the very least through refugee crises, um, that it's, it's a much more important uh, area of focus uh, than East Asia, and it certainly portends poorly of our ability to focus on all things at the same time, that we can't even prevent that in our own hemisphere um, while we're trying to have all of these commitments across the globe. As a political matter, do you worry that a candidate saying the things that you're saying right now would be outflanked in a Republican primary as being weak on China? No, I mean, again, I, 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 so no, no one trusts me to be a political pundit, no, but, no, no, but, but, yeah. here, but here's what I'll say. I, I think that the, the argument that Donald Trump made when he flipped the Republican Party from 30-70 to 70-30 in the other direction on the issue of trade um, was not um, about human rights abuses in China, it was not about Taiwan, it was you're getting screwed. I think that the economic argument is resonant with the American people, um, and you don't have to use uh, you know, Byzantine terms like industrial policy to describe it. You ask voters how they feel about pro-made in the USA policies, they'll vote for you all the live long day, and um, I think we should, we should focus on that. Yeah, so um, I want to ask some questions about tactics and representation. You remarked uh, that social conservatives are woefully underrepresented in Washington as opposed to their ranks in the rest of the country. But this is an event also about young conservatives, millennials and Gen Z are in the name. Uh, and uh, you know, it may be the case that all of the hardcore social conservative counter-revolutionaries in the country under the age of 30 are in this room. Because <laughs> under the age of 30, uh, if you identify as a Republican, you are much more likely to stake out moderate or uh, liberal positions on things like climate change, same-sex marriage, you run down the list. So does it matter uh, if the you know, quote-unquote new right is an elite phenomenon? No, because the idea that it is somehow, like, I don't believe that we need to be insecure about the idea that young people don't want to vote for the right, whatever flavor of right that it is. Um, if the conservative movement and the Republican Party are going to stand for anything, it should be the protection of permanent things. And guess who doesn't have a lot of permanent things to protect? Transient young people. Um, you vote Republican to protect things like uh, the uh, integrity of your home by voting for tough on crime policies, for you know appropriate taxation so that all your money isn't taken away from you, for good schools so that your children, which most young people don't have, are not taught racial poison and gender poison and all this other stuff. Uh, I think a conservative movement worth the name, a Republican party worth existing, a political right that deserves to be called as such, uh, seeks the protection of those permanent things, and there's always a cross-section of odd people, many of whom are represented in this room, and I consider myself <laughs> fully part of it, that have a, a, a love of and an adherence to those permanent things at a young age when they may not have them themselves, and that's okay um, for the purposes of building a, a policy-making movement in Washington such that we can actually implement those priorities. It's important to seek those people out and place them in, but on an aggregate level, the fact that, you know, TikTok obsessed, unmarried, childless, transient. Well, these Zoomers. are these are. I mean, I'm also talking about people who identify as Republican voters under the age of 30, not just you sure, know, sort of TikTok sure. Issues. But even even those Republican voters. I mean, political party the polling shows uh, is is almost a hereditary phenomenon. To the extent you're a young person Republican, it's probably the case because your parents were. Um, people will naturally start to vote in a in a rationally self-interested way as they get older and older and have actual political concerns. Uh, most young people do not have actual political concerns, the likes of which the right is traditionally responsible for, for adhering to. And so I, I don't, there, there's not a bone in my body that's insecure about the fact that the Republican Party in the United States is traditionally the old-er party. Um, that's, that's totally fine by me. Yeah, so uh, let's stop talking so much about young people and talk about Americans in general. You know, I think there's a certain moral authority that comes when members of the political elite can claim that their views are not just the providence of Washington, but are authentically held by uh, the common man, the median American. Um, and you know, I see graphs by Lee Drutman pass around where there are lots of dots in the top left corner kind of suggesting nobody's libertarian. And I hear talk about the middle American radicals who don't actually oppose you know, receiving federal health care benefits. But uh, you know, John Judas and Lee Drutman are not the only analysts to look at American public opinion, and folks like David Hackett Fisher or Matthew Walter, uh, two people who are not usually grouped together, have <laughs> identified, uh, they have identified a, well, not just them, by the way, lots of people, have identified a folk libertarianism that runs deep in the American fabric. 
uh, from the Scottish borderers who came to the back country in the 1800s to the barstool conservatives who today uh, like le legal gambling, probably watch porn, watch a lot of sports, but are against cancel culture and for free speech. So, and, and you know, of course, also it should not go uh, unsaid that the most popular, I think, anti-left directionally figure in the country is like a DMT evangelist, bodybuilder, libertarian comedian. <laughs> so, with all of that said, Elliot, I want to ask you, uh, you know, libertarians catch a lot of flack in Washington, but isn't there sort of a folk libertarianism woven into the American fabric, and doesn't that mean something as both a political and policy matter? Absolutely. It has to. I mean, anyone who doesn't think uh, that there's an impulse in this, you know, country to say, leave me alone, to say, let, you like, uh, kind of government hands off, I think, is not paying attention. And any conservative movement that would um, surrender hold of that, of, you know, channeling that impulse is doomed, I think. And, I mean, sort of goes back to something that you were asking me before. Okay, um, new challenges, right? Uh, shouldn't this be the time to kind of drop our, you know, default suspicion of government action, of state action? I think this would be the worst moment for that. I mean, if people look around, we are in the midst of unprecedented restrictions on Americans' liberty, pandemic restrictions. I mean, uh, the sorts of things that have been taken away from people, uh, how many people have been forced out of their, of, you know, of work, livelihood, uh, forced out of society, they can't enter anywhere, they can't get into an Uber to go anywhere, I mean, uh, uh, okay. Um, kids out of schools, I mean, we have seen unbelievable overreach by the state ignoring people's rights. And there is a crisis, so this kind of folk libertarianism thing, people will say, okay, it's a crisis, I, I guess in a crisis you have to do something. People are waking up right now, and I think we are seeing this folk libertarianism reassert itself in such a strong way. Uh, now is the moment to drop our suspicion of, you know, government overreach, of state power. Now would be the worst moment for that. And I think you really have to listen to the American people on this, the conservative movement more than anyone. Alexandra? Your reaction? Yeah, I agree with that. And I think there's kind of a tendency on the right, and I I'm, don't consider myself a libertarian, so I'm happy to, to criticize things about the libertarian point of view. But I think um, libertarians have a natural and important home on the right, and we shouldn't ignore perhaps the, the civil libertarian aspect of it, I think is essential to conservatism. Uh, it's essential to being an American. And I think um, kind of as Elliot alluded to, at the very least, it's deeply politically unpopular to suggest that, you know, there's no room for individual rights or that kind of we need the state to do everything for us. That's a really actually dem Democrat tendency, right? That's not something conservatives think. And so as much as I agree that there are places where libertarians go too far in the individual rights direction, on, certainly on social issues, um, in my view, that, that is not a reason to say these people don't belong on the right. Their natural home is on the right. And all conservatives, in my view, should have kind of a... Um, you know, a vision of the human person that uh, necessitates respect for individual liberties. I love folk libertarians. They're great. Um, here's the thing, though. Uh, let's take the context of the pandemic. Uh, what folk libertarianism implemented in the public policy will get you is, yes, a lifting of municipal mask and vaccine mandates. But when the world uh, of, of law goes away and people still have to wear masks and get, show vaccine cards in airports or in businesses, those same folk libertarians are very happy when Ron DeSantis bans private institutions from implementing mask mandates or vaccine mandates. Um, take your government hands off my Medicare was a, a chant during the Tea Party, or at least it was a very prominent sign. There is a distinction to be made between Americans who love liberty and they resent um, cultural, economic, and political elites that want to foist a way of life on them that is wholly alien, and the idea that there should be no role for public policy in creating spaces for that liberty to actually exist. You talk to 
a folk libertarian Republican voter, and I recognize I'm speaking from anecdote here, but I, but I have quite a few of them having lived in Texas for many years, going to Tea Party meetings and stuff, people who would call themselves dyed-in-the-wool libertarians to their bones. They have no problem when you tell them that we should regulate Facebook and Google and any other institution they believe is censoring conservatives into the dirt. Um, that does not trigger their libertarian priors because they see it as an infringement on the the kind of spiritual principle of liberty that is being infringed on when the largest technology conglomerates in the country conspire to ensure that right-wing political speech is, is, is subordinate. Um, and so there is a distinction to be made between a folk libertarian, um, we use that adjective folk for a reason, and the kinds of people who populate this town whose goal it is to make sure that we enshrine section 230 as in stone like Moses handed down the Ten Commandments or the idea that um, what's really important is capital gains tax cuts or the idea that we should open our borders for some sort of faux libertarian reason. Um, and th th there's just such a distinction to be made between the folk libertarian and the things that they want to ensure um, are, are, are remain uh, when it comes to the American way of life and the libertarian priorities of policymakers in this town. They're almost two entirely separate universes, and usually those deeply unpopular libertarian impulses in public policy are the ones that are primary. Those folk libertarian tendencies are often considered the icky, closest thing to cultural issues um, that many people in this town try to stay away from. Any reactions, or should I keep going? All right, well, uh, another question about tactics. So, ideological movements have long been prone to infighting. American conservatism in 2022 is no different, as we are uh, living. Populists have complained that legacy institutions are more interested in policing the boundaries of conservatism, punching right, than in defending the principles that they allegedly exist to conserve. Is this tendency to gatekeep limited to these legacy institutions? I don't know. Shortly after Election Day in 2020, the editors of another think tank aligned magazine published an article not only calling on Republicans to fight the result, but calling out, quote, their weak sisters on the right. And I believe you asserted recently, Saurabh, that uh, if a popular journalist with sort of contrarian tendencies wanted to join the right, she would be enjoined to do so only as a humble participant or not at all. Uh, I'll let you clarify whether that was meant in a jocular spirit, but first I will ask the panel, um, do you guys worry that various right-wing factions are sometimes more interested in sharpening their elbows and defending themselves against internecine enemies than in trying to expand their coalition? Uh, you guys can take that in any order you decide. Yeah, I, I worry about that a lot. And I think um, kind of at the political level, if it's you know political candidates, that kind of thing makes a lot more sense, especially in the primary context. There are important distinctions um, when we're, we're talking about voting to be made between particular pol political platforms on the right. Uh, but since I've gotten into conservative journalism, you know, right when Donald Trump was uh, marching down to defeat Hillary Clinton in 2016, uh, I've seen just a really, I think, absurd level of fighting among conservatives at a time when unity would much better serve us and the things we're fighting about are not actually that important. Like the distinctions between what we're talking about and you know, one conservative flavor or another are not actually that impor important compared to what we're dealing with on the left. And I think a lot of it from my perspective comes from sort of over, uh, oversaturation with social media um, oversaturation with kind of looking for attention and trying to, you know, uh, elbow to the right perhaps to be the, the true conservative and get people to pay attention to you because there's only so much attention to go around. And I think that sort of thing is really damaging. Um, and there's obviously a place for, you know, if someone said to me, oh, I'm, I'm, I think abortion is great and wonderful, but I'm, you know, pro-tax cuts, I'd say, okay, that's fine. That's a conservative policy. I don't really want the conservative movement as a whole to be pro-abortion. I don't love, love that about you, but you're welcome to consider yourself a conservative, right? And so there's ways in which we can kind of uh, say what our main mission ought to be without ostracizing people who agree with us on one issue or another. Um, but from my perspective, a lot of it comes down to just personality and people's, people trying to kind of suck the air out of the room for their own, their own personal attention rather than kind of uh, chart a, a course forward or a mission that we all can agree on. Whichever. I mean, look, no, no one opposes the conservative case for writing essays at each other until we all die more than I do. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm a big believer in convincing young people to get involved in substantive policy questions and deleting their Twitter account. We, we do so in our programming at American Moment. However, I will say, um, 
the uh, ability to call for unity is a luxury of power. Um, you get to call for unity when you are the dominant faction on the right or in any uh, you know, ecosystem that's being described. Um, it's the same thing with you know, an appeal to true conservatism. Um, the part of the reason why I don't really adjectivize my conservatism or, or hyphenate it in any sort of way is because I think that the ability to determine what is true conservatism is a byproduct luxury of power and why not fake it till we make it. So I'm willing to call the entire set of policies that I believe in true conservatism and uh, we'll see if I end up being correct. Um, so, you know, look, like, I, I think that there's a fundamental distinction between how the right approaches politics and how the left approaches politics that is ultimately to the right's detriment. Um, the left believes in a kind of tactical ecumenism. Um, they will never uh, punch the left, and often they kind of wink and nod and say, whatever you're doing that's, that's crazy on the left is fine. Kamala Harris um, uh, encouraged people to donate to bail funds for rioters uh, in, in a... In, in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, or, or wherever that particular riot was. Can you imagine the equivalent um, of it from a vice president on the right of center? It just wouldn't happen, or it would be met with enormous scorn. Editorial pages would convene and, and, and heap scorn upon um, any vice president or president or any other major elected official who did so. Um, I think that you can have fulsome uh, and aggressive disagreement internal to your own faction while also recognizing that the goal is to move in a particular direction. And if we want even a fusionist consensus to be the center, the mainstream of policy in American life, guess what? There necessarily have to be a bunch of stuff to the right and a bunch of stuff that you'll probably disagree with and find icky because the cultural forces that exist are, are deeply encouraging to leftward trends and very discouraging to rightward trends. And so um, my problem with the idea that we can't be fighting is it results in the status quo where anything to the right of a certain incumbent mainstream consensus uh, in the conservative movement is literally Hitler and anything slightly to the center left of that is, is good faith disagreement that must be contended with and the, the, the people responsible for um, that uh, slice must be welcomed into the conservative movement with open arms. In the case of the tweet that you referenced, it was Barry Weiss, who everyone seemed to be worshiping as the second coming of Christ because she said some things that, that. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, because, because she uh, had an outburst on Bill Maher's show talking about the insensibility of pandemic restrictions that conservatives have been talking about for the better part of a year. Um, I, I do not want to coronate Barry Weiss as the new champion of conservatism, and I'm not saying that you are, um, but that was the point of the, the tweet that I had put yeah, out. Yeah, absolutely. Elliot, yeah. your thoughts? I would just, I mean, you said that one, of, one advantage that the left has is that it doesn't punch left. Um, that's not an advantage that I want on the right. Um, there, are, there are racists to my right. I don't want them on the team. I think that including them on the team will end, us, will, uh, end up hurting us more than anything because the media and the left, same thing, but whatever, will say uh, that's all of them. And I think we make their job easy when we refuse to punch right. And you said, you know, can you imagine a figure, you know, a vice president on the right doing something like this? I just thought there was a president who did some stuff not too long ago, made some comments associated with some uh, people. Um, so I can imagine it. Um, and I think that element of it did not help him and won't help us. So I'm proud to punch right uh, when, you know, we're dealing with truly bad people. And I would also comment that when people in some of these conservative micro-movements uh, criticize other conservatives, from my point of view, they're punching right all the time. From my point of view, American moment, all it does is punch right. Uh, so... Please, please. So, so, I mean, that's your prerogative. Uh, I punch right too, but uh, uh, I'm happy with that. Give you a chance to respond since it's your organization. Yeah, totally. I mean, look, like, uh, you, you are welcome to scroll through the Twitter feed of American Moment. I think you'd, you'd be surprised. We exercise pretty serious institutional discipline. Well, my, what's on my Twitter feed, uh, I don't feel the need to put, you know, opinions are my own, but, you know, it's, it's entirely separate. Um, look, like, uh, 
I don't really care about that particular criticism. What I will say, however, is that, um, you know, they told Mitt Romney he was going to put black people back in chains. Uh, it doesn't matter how genteel, how kind you are, how tightly you police the borders of your own faction. You can nominate the most demure, august leaders for any political movement. The left will apply the same smear from everyone to Barry Weiss, uh, to, you know, uh, what was the name of that Louisiana guy? David Duke. Um, <laughs> every, uh, th th to them, they are all racists or, or, or suspected white supremacists. And so the question is, how do you operate in political life recognizing that that uh, label is going to be used to tarnish the majority of your political faction, even the majority of the political faction narrowly construed that maybe uh, incumbent institutions on the right would like? Um, in the eyes of the left, they're all majority racists. And so maybe it's better to stop using that term or, or, or any other uh, term of art, bigot, racist, sexist, whatever, um, instead of accepting the moral frame of the left, um, having our own moral frame. And that's where I won't disagree with you. If you find someone personally morally objectionable, I would never ask you to like, hold silence in your own heart against them. Um, but make sure it's that and not um, trying to be the last to be sent uh, to the proverbial gulag because the left um, will, will pass over you in order uh, because, because you're willing to call out you know, other people as racist or sexist or any other bigoted term. Hey sure, so uh, this... I just, think, yeah. I just think the left will call us racist no matter what, but it matters to me whether they're right or they're wrong. That's right. yeah. uh, and I think it'll matter to other Americans too. Yeah. So that's all. All right. Um, Thanks, everybody, for remaining quiet. I have one more question. Uh, I, I think it's a mark of our youth that we have managed to go through a discussion of um, conservative politics, various conservative factions, without saying the name Ronald Reagan. But <laughs> if, you will, if you will indulge me, um, you know, close your eyes and think about the 1970s. Conservatives are either out of power or struggling to do anything while they are in power. They, uh, there are many factions. There's National Review expressing a hardline anti-welfarist politics with the hardline anti-communist politics. There are traditionalists who prefer communitarianism to capitalism and look fondly to the southern agrarians. There are neoconservatives in the cities seeking to both counter radicalism but also advance pragmatic reforms to the welfare state. And there is a new right uh, which takes a populist line, uh, has appeal in the Midwest and the West Coast, and criticizes its competitors for not fighting hard enough. All of these factions, uh, they clashed at times, uh, and then they were eventually unified under one leader who managed to incorporate elements of each tendency and help all feel more or less represented, fat, and happy. So, number one, how do you guys think today's conflicts compare throughout the history of the American uh, conservative movement? And uh, secondly, you don't have to say a name, but if you could imagine a figure, once Trump kind of fades into the twilight, I'm taking him out of consideration here, to, who could reach this sort of synthesis uh, among all the various conservative factions, what would that figure, how would he or she sound? Uh, what would they talk about? What kinds of policies would they champion? Um, let's just go down the line. Um, so the two questions, how, does it, how do you think these uh, current disputes great in the history of the conservative movement, sure. and then what would the leader look like? Sure. Uh, one of my favorite Bible verses is Ecclesiastes 1.9, there's nothing new under the sun, and I believe the same is true about internecine right-wing warfare. Um, and this is part of the reason why uh, you will never hear me use the term new right. Um, one, because that's exactly what the National Review ca crowd called themselves when they were the insurgents fighting against an incumbent entrenched bureaucracy on the right that thought that they were ridiculous radicals. Um, and two, uh, because I also believe there's nothing new about the idea that there should be sanity in our immigration policy, our foreign policy, our trading policy, and that we should take cultural battles seriously. Those are ideas that have been championed by very patriotic, decent people for the last half century. And I would uh, feel dishonest and immoral um, taking on uh, the virtue of correctness on those issues um, without acknowledging um, those, um, those people who have come before. Um, so internecine battles on the right are, are very common. Um, and so perhaps there's a roadmap we can look to in the past on how these things can be reconciled. And this is where the whole three-legged stool thing gets, gets very interesting, right? Um, it, was, it is this sort of perversion of the idea of what the coalitional right was um, towards the end of the 20th century that 
um, the sort of conservative operator in a place like DC is someone who is simultaneously a foreign policy hawk, a cultural conservative um, uh, in private matters and you know, a social conservative in the few government areas of abortion and religious liberty, and also an economic libertarian. That political consensus was the process by which different parts of a faction came to compromises that were embodied in particular politicians and rank ordered in legislative agendas. Um, they were never meant to be embodied in all people all the time. Um, and so uh, that is the roadmap for what a consensus would look like today, is recognizing that there are legitimate primary threats that each of these factions see and finding ways to negotiate in appropriate accordance with how they're represented in the electorate, a new uh, conservative consensus that takes seriously the challenges of today, much like Ronald Reagan did at the time that he was president. Um, Please, guys, save the applause for the end. Thanks. And, 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 and that's um, what it would look like. Now, what sort of figure it appears in? Um, you took Trump off the table, but I will say tonally, it looks a lot closer to Donald Trump than it does like anything else in the Republican Party. At this point, um, things are dire. Uh, at the time that Ronald Reagan was elected, conservatives enjoyed a silent majority in the broader populace of the American people. They enjoyed some level of cultural power um, such that people were able to get you know, uh, uh, movies occasionally uh, suppressed for lewdness or, or, or anti-American sentiment. They, they enjoyed real cultural forces. They um, definitely had the power of corporate America behind their side. Um, and so if you, if you and, and they were uh, you know, able to win elections specifically in the, in the election of Ronald Reagan. What is it that the right's uh, looking at today? Uh, total, total loss on the cultural level. Um, a, a real sort of um, uh, unclear consensus in the mass of the American people because most people uh, sort of uh, acclimatize themselves to whatever the prevailing consensus is. And so most people are, are going to lean left because that's where it seems like most of the power is. Um, they've lost corporate America, and the Fortune 500 list is full of some of the largest donors to civilizational enemies of the right and of the country um, that you'll ever find. And occasionally we're able to win elections, but when we do, we don't seem to do very much to address these other power imbalances. Uh, and so I do not blame people when they look at someone like Donald Trump who actually fights for the legitimate uh, minoritization in terms of power that the right feels by sticking it to cultural forces, by telling the biggest CEOs that they can go screw themselves, and certainly by talking to the permanent uh, ruling consensus in, in DC with utter contempt. Um, so tonally, it is an approach of combativeness on policy. It is a consensus that recognizes the premier threats that face us today. Um, and who that uh, happens to be is, I think, an open question, because if you had asked us in 2012 who the top two vote getters in the Republican primary would be, I think very few people would have guessed someone who had just been elected to the U.S. Senate in Ted Cruz and a game show host in Donald Trump. Yeah. That's what I'll yeah, say there. Fair enough. Alexandra. Yeah. Um, I would say I think the situation on the right is not something new. I think um, you laid out the 1970s. I've been reading recently about the 1980 primary campaign among Republicans, and I will tell you it's as nasty as anything I've seen <laughs> going on lately. It was kind of heartening to see, you know, this has been happening forever. Um, so I think what's going on on the right is not new, but I think the, kind of as you alluded to, the situation that we're um, facing as a country is new. I think we're in a very different place than we were then, in particular, uh, in terms of where the left has gone since then, what they're standing for now, especially on, in cultural terms. Uh, and I think just the, the world has changed a lot, right? Globalization, um, kind of everything is digital, social media, things have just really changed a lot. And so I think that that is um, why we need a, a kind of a different type of candidate. And I think um, Saul is right too, that there was something about Trump that was appealing. And as much as I really didn't like him, there were certain things that he did that other politicians hadn't done uh, where he was successful. But I won't say we need the next Ronald Reagan, uh, but there was something about Reagan that people loved, right? And he, he did manage to unify the right in a very successful way. And he won 49 states, by the way. Like, that's absurd. Can you imagine a Republican being able to do that now? I think it would take a really outstanding person, not just somebody, you know, someone, someone of good character. And by that, I don't mean someone who's polite all the time. I mean a, a good, uh, decent person who Americans can respect regardless of which side of the aisle they're on. I think that that really matters, and we shouldn't give up on that, even though the other side and, and the world, I guess, that has gotten quite nasty. Elliot. 
So Reagan won two terms and then passed on a third. Uh, I think hadn't been done since Grant. So, and by the way, should have passed on four, really, not just uh, three. So that's why people talk a lot about Reagan. It's not that hard to understand. He was incredibly successful. Um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I saw this ad recently from Blake Masters, who's running for office in Arizona. And uh, I'm not the biggest fan of his, but he started it off uh, by saying, you know, why is it so difficult to support a family on a single income? And that's a, you know, a sort of new right framing, let's say, but a good one, a good question, certainly. Um, and he said, well, three important things have gotten more expensive in America. And he named them, you could also, housing, healthcare, education. What's been happening here? Um, he went through what's been happening. Housing, he says, um, can't build homes. So of course the price is gonna rise. Why can't you build homes? Because of all these regulations. He focused on environmental regulations because that's a more popular issue, but as we know, there are many other regulations, zoning regulations, etc. So uh, government regulation stopping that market from operating. He got to healthcare. What did he say? He said prices. You can't find healthcare prices. How can you have a market operate without prices? Market mechanisms don't work. So he said, okay, there's, there's, uh, there's again, the system uh, in which the market is not being allowed to operate. Education, he said, universities are expanding bureaucracies to raise costs. Why? Because of government subsidies, all the student loans, more government subsidies. The government is doing it. And I, I thought about the message and I thought, Here's a new right diagnosis of the problem with small government solutions. And I thought that could be a powerful message. New right diagnosis, small government solutions. And I told this to my friend, Sam Goldman, and he kind of whispered to me, he said, that's what Reaganism was. That's what Reaganism was. A merger of populism and conservatism in a way that didn't make it seem extreme, which is what Goldwater's conservatism sometimes did, but in a way that made it seem like the most common sense thing in the world. And so when I see people talking about stale Reaganism, Reaganism has, Reaganism has gone stale, they say, I think um, they don't understand anything about what Reaganism was and they don't understand anything about what our moment is right now either. Because problems of the 1970s, inflation, crime, welfare, national dishonor, stagflation we don't have, but what do we have, like four out of five? I mean, that's not bad. So, so when I hear people making these kinds of comments, I think they, I think, they don't understand Reaganism, and they don't understand our present political moment. All right, guys. Well, uh, we were going to do audience Q&A, but that was an hour, and so we're not going to. So please, round of applause for the panelists. Um, yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't prepare any closing remarks, but uh, thank you all very much for agreeing to do this. I think it was a great event, and I'm sure we will all discuss everything that was set up here for a while. So thank you guys again. Thank you. Great job. I appreciate it. It was interesting, eh? Yeah.